get started now. Um, hello, I'm Jessica Leno, the Interim Director of the King Center. As you probably know already, the King Center is a Stanford University Research Center um, that's working to improve the lives of the world's poor. And thanks everyone for joining us on this discussion on research disruptions and interruptions. And I'm very pleased that we have King Center faculty affiliates, Marcel Falchamps, Saad Golzar, and Meredith Starts with us today. All three have extensive experience conducting surveys, experiments, and lab and field work in a number of countries in Asia and Africa. We're also joined by Corinne Thomas, a program manager at the King Center, and she'll be available after the faculty discussion um, to answer any questions on the mechanics of King Center research funding and how we're adapting um, due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Marcel, Meredith, and Saad, thanks. We appreciate you joining today, and it would be great if you could each share a situation that you've dealt with in your own research um, or are currently dealing with where field work has been disrupted and how you've gone about handling it. And then we'll then open it up for questions. So um, if you're asking a question, please do use the raise hand feature and I'll call on you to speak. Um, and if you could identify um, what department you're in and um, the year you're in in your program, that would be helpful at um, tailoring answers um, for you. Um, or feel free to ask your question in the, into the chat and I'll read it to the panelists. And please do keep yourself muted until you've been called on. And Leslie Murray, who is our event planner, will be assisting with muting and unmuting as we go along. Um, we're very excited for this discussion and for your questions. So Marcel, I'll pass the virtual mic to you to share about your research, and then you can pass the mic as it were to Saad and then Meredith. Thanks very much. Okay, so you asked me to comment on um, the way, the, you know, possible disruptions that, that have taken place, right? Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, we were relatively fortunate in the sense that uh, some of the surveys we had in the field and experiments and all that were basically completed recently, so we didn't have a disruption. I had one, um, I still have one online experiment which covers multiple countries and that wasn't disrupted either. If anything, you know, people are sitting at home doing nothing, they're quite happy to check their Facebook page and see whether they get recruited for, for an online online lab experiment so that that, that wasn't bad there was one big um, experiment we were experiment we were running in ethiopia that has been disrupted that one basically it's an rct so it's been it's been cut halfway through um we decided to continue doing the baseline or parts of the baseline by phone so it, it's not clear that this is a it's certainly not a perfect substitute to face-to-face -face interviews, but uh, that's what we decided to do in that case so that we keep some momentum going. Um, that's the... And um, the other thing we've, we've been doing is that we've also tried to... We've put together already one or two proposals now to get these, you know, these, little, these short um, proposals that have been uh, solicited for for calls that are COVID-19 specific. So if we've put, with Pascaline and I, Pascaline Dupin and I have put two of these uh, proposals through, but uh, I mean, in the last few days, basically. Yeah. And that would all be phone-based. Uh, sad, your turn. Okay, um, thank you. So I have had, I think, a very similar experience actually, because, um, um, some of the projects that I was working on had already ended, but th there were a couple of projects that were in the field and it remains to be seen how successful we are uh, with alternative strategies. So in one project, <clears throat> we were waiting to collect outcomes. Um, it was a project on political responsiveness with uh, a, a few politicians in Pakistan and we were waiting to sort of get outcome data uh, on responsiveness itself. But as a result of COVID, all political activities have sort of taken a backseat to COVID responsiveness. So we, we, we thought, okay, now this is an opportunity to sort of study something where, um, where specific, uh, where the responsiveness is a bit more specific and where you could sort of trace um, potentially outcome data with regards to health. Uh, but you know that as is the case with many pilots, um, the pilot kind of failed and we decided not to go down that route. But what we did do in that project was we moved again a survey that was uh, we were going to do at the end line to a phone survey 
and we were just we, we had actually not considered running the phone survey before but now that we're transitioning to the phone survey the actual expense on that project has gone down tremendously and we can reach a much larger sample it's just that we had never thought about doing a phone survey in this uh, setting before but in this project what was nice was that we already had people's phone numbers and it was a matter of sort of getting fresh IRB um, approvals to approach those people via phone instead of uh, in person um, so that survey is hopefully going out in the field in another week or two um, and it'll wrap up actually it's about a 10,000 person survey which is going to get wrapped up very fast so so that's some of the benefits of doing a phone-based survey um, in another project we've done the baseline and we we're waiting for the government to announce local elections uh, before we could launch the treatment and collect uh, and line data but that project is sort of indefinitely on hold now and there isn't really any remedial measures that we could take because of the nature of the experiment itself um, finally you know like many other people where um, the government in pakistan approached us to sort of help them design the covid 19 responsiveness and we're working with them to uh, uh, to use their existing frontline bureaucrats to make phone calls to a large set of citizens to inform them about how, what preventive measures they can take. And um, what I want to stress in this case is that, you know, even though I'm not a public health expert, they came to us with the idea that, you know, we could, we could help them think analytically about these questions. And then we then had the opportunity to think about what kinds of research projects we could uh, put on top of those um, of those things that we're going to do with them anyway. So we ended up deciding to design a survey where we motivate these frontline bureaucrats to carry out this COVID-19 related work. And that project kind of fits in with my research agenda of thinking about uh, politicians and bureaucrats and how to motivate them to improve public sector outcomes. And I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, so. Thanks, Jessica, for convening this. I'm interested to hear how everybody else is managing things um, as well. Um, so for me, I had four projects that were either actively uh, in field work mode or about to be when this all hit. And so two of them um, in two different countries were field experiments where kind of the nature of the intervention, like Saad was saying, made, made it pretty hard to think about how we could keep going under current circumstances. So in one, you know, we needed to actually be taking samples of agricultural products to get tested, and we can't really do that if we can't be out in the field and moving around. Um, and in the other one, we were in the process of marketing a new financial product in um, markets in Nigeria, and we couldn't really responsibly have our marketers moving around in markets, even before um, Lagos got completely locked down, which obviously, <laughs> Also, also makes that impossible. So um, on the first project, we've basically put the field work component on indefinite hold, but we had pretty extensive um, pilot survey data that to be perfectly frank, it's probably gonna benefit the project in the long run if we spend a little bit more time digging into that data and being really thoughtful about what it does and doesn't do for us and how we wanna adjust things before the baseline. You know, a lot of field projects realistically end up happening on a, a pretty high speed timeline and there are things that just get missed because you need to move ahead. And so, you know, while it's not great for this project to be put on hold for so long, um, especially since it's not like we can get going as soon as, um, you know, restrictions are lifted because it's something that's kind of timed for agricultural harvest season. So really, we're going to have to wait probably more than another full year. To get going again but i do think that like taking the time um, to sit back and have ras and me working more on pilot data analysis and thinking really hard and coming up with kind of a bulletproof pre-analysis plan um, and so on probably will have benefits for the project um, for the other rct um, the project itself is on hold we kind of similarly are taking this as an opportunity to step back a little bit and talk through with the partner organization some revisions that we could make both to the product and to the marketing strategy um, while we can't be in the field anyway and that project also sort of coincidentally got hit by another bad shock right before all of this started so one of the main markets we were working in got uh, partially demolished by the government <laughs> So we were gonna have to kind of switch locations 
anyway. Um, but one thing that we're thinking about doing now is kind of a, a, a spin-off project um, with trying to do what we were already thinking about phone survey based follow up with uh, the traders in that market who we had already done a baseline with. And so we already had contact information and kind of look at the impact of the market demolition on them with a, some kind of fairly simple difference in difference sort of design. Um, so I guess that's that's sort of the, the directions we're going on the projects that had interventions. The other two projects in theory could keep going with phone-based surveys. In one of them, um, we didn't have a sample frame already set. And so we didn't really have pre-existing contact information for respondents. And so, you know, while if this had happened three months later, we probably would have been set to do a big phone survey, we're not. And so that is just purely on indefinite hold. The fourth project, um, we were pretty lucky that this was a group of traders in Nigeria that we've been following for about five years. So we'd done multiple rounds of in-person surveys with them already, and we had kind of an established relationship and a field team on the ground. And so they've fully transitioned to doing high frequency weekly phone surveys with those traders. And part of that is targeted at sort of just some descriptive things about how coronavirus is impacting them and their businesses, but some of it is also looking at kind of interactions with the topics we were already interested in um, about their sort of remote purchasing from suppliers all over the world and how their buyer and seller relationships look. Um, so that one is going ahead in kind of an altered form, but very active. Yeah, and thanks very much to all of you. It's great to hear um, all the various ways um, and stages where um, projects are impacted and, and how you're thinking about moving forward. Um, we had a couple of questions um, when people registered that they asked. Um, let's see, we'll, we can start with some of those. Uh, Prachi Jane asked, um, what should we be doing now or how should we leverage our time while we wait for field research to start? And in a similar vein, Lee asked, how can I plan ahead for field work? despite the uncertainty of when I'll be able to travel. Um, appreciate your thoughts on, on these questions. I, I, I think this is not unusual. So what's unusual is the scale of it. It affects all the countries pretty much. Um, but if you are working internationally, this is gonna happen anyway, that there are gonna be elections, violence, or you know, flood, riot, something like that. There are always going to be unexpected events that will that will affect your capacity to to do the work, or even not necessarily over the whole region, but perhaps some part of the region. And so, sometimes it happens even within the, 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 the while you're on the field, and then something happens, and you have to pull out of the field. So, I think this is this is something that is not unusual. What is unusual is the scale of it, and it, that, that it affects everybody at the same time. Uh, in, in normal circumstances, what you do is that, you know, you can't work on project number one or work site or field work site number one. Then as a researcher, you know, we all have portfolio of products, projects, so you just move to another one. Um, of course, as a PhD student, typically you, you, you know, you're not going to have a portfolio. You have one or, or two maybe. So then it, it, it's, it's, it's less, it's, it's more problematic to adjust. Besides, you have also a very tight uh, time schedule, I suppose. So I guess, but, but, you know, when you enter the, the, the when you, you, you set yourself for, for, for doing international work, in, in a sense, that risk was already there from the beginning. The risk that maybe the site you, you had chosen or the topic you had chosen would suddenly close down. So, so I think that the, the, the flexibility is, is, is the name of the game here. You, you have to, um, to adjust to the to the circumstances, I would say. So adjustment can be that you um, move online, which is or, or on, on the phone, which is what we've already been discussing. Um, you, you might have other other alternatives using observational data or using data that somebody has already collected before. Um, but that basically you have to think about what the alternatives are. Basically, and but. But as, as, I, as I said, it's, you should not see this as, um, as something that, you know, will affect you once in your life and, and it's kind of a useless learning. It's actually, it's part of the learning of being a researcher. There are always, uh, you know, things you cannot predict and 
and obstacles to field work. So that, that happen at, uh, at random times. And so this is something that you will learn from this time and hopefully you will, you will, it's something that will, you'll, will be useful to you through your, throughout your research life. I just add that, um, you know, as Marcel said, this is, this will happen if you're doing field research. So there are two or three strategies that I had in mind to help you cope with this. I mean, one is to think of it as something that you might encounter in any field research. Uh, but one way to, to, to cope with the thing like this is to diversify your portfolio and add secondary data projects uh, if they don't already exist. And, you know, saying that is easy. Sometimes it's hard to think about, you know, if you're, if you're only thinking in terms of a field-based project, it might be hard to think about what might be things that are in your um, vicinity that you can work on with secondary data. So as faculty that are advising you, often they have data sitting around um, that they haven't had a chance to look at. Maybe those are things that you can explore and you know get papers out of those uh, specific ideas. Um, another thing that I advise one of my graduate students was to think about writing a descriptive paper with the data that they already had. So they'd done already some kind of a baseline activity and were gearing up towards doing um, an end line you know, with the full project. Uh, but the baseline itself was interesting enough that, you know, one could write a paper with just that. And so think about those kinds of opportunities as well. Sometimes there's a lot of value and a lot of learning you can get just from descriptive work. Uh, so see if your specific project is best suited for it. Another thing that Meredith said, I think, which is uh, extremely important is this is, think of this also as helping you um, take a wider look at your existing portfolio. Um, uh, you know, this, maybe this is a time to really craft that uh, pre-analysis plan or uh, or uh, write out uh, or, or think about how, you know, further fieldwork that you're going to do is going to be informed by what data you have already collected. Um, so, you know, that's another thing you can do. And finally, you know, there are new opportunities. There's a lot more money available for COVID-related uh, research. So see if those are opportunities that you can tap into. Early reports suggest that people might now be more willing to be on the phone, you know, having been stuck at home for two months plus. So maybe now is a good time to run some phone surveys where you weren't thinking about doing that before. You know, maybe slightly longer phone surveys are more possible now than they weren't before. So, so I, I would say, I mean, I, I agree that this is kind of always part of being somebody who does field work, but you know, as Marcel said, if you're, you get hit with floods or elections or, you know, the markets are working and get demolished or whatever it is. Um, I do think, I do think um, the situation is different and harder, you know, not only because probably all of your projects are paused, but also because some of the usual solutions, which might be to sort of switch to a different location or work with a different partner or, you know, know with certainty that you'll be able to move ahead in six months are kind of not available to us right now. So I can understand that being more stressful than kind of the usual disruptions. Um, I guess depending on kind of your stage and your program and how much time pressure you're into. Uh, the way I'm thinking about this for myself is kind of coming up with three different plans, right? So plan one is the Suppose I'm going to move ahead with this project basically as planned, but at some uncertain time in the future. Right, what do I need to do? Then that's the like, I can work on my pre analysis plan. I can kind of look descriptively at the data I have so far. I can talk to partners. I can, you know, think about what, how much lead time I would need when I am ready to go back to the field and then kind of backward and doc, what do I need to be working on now? Um, so that's kind of one plan. My second plan is uh, suppose that I'm going to keep working on kind of this or a related version of a project, but it needs to be changed or kind of pivoted in some way, right? So we're going to switch to a different survey mode. We're going to, um, you know, look at actually a slightly different question here. We're going to pull in a new partner. There's an opportunity to do a different kind of intervention that's relevant to the current situation and just kind of brainstorm are there ways to, you know, kind of so suppose I wasn't, I, I wasn't stuck in kind of the way I was originally thinking of this project and I just let go of that, right? Are there kind of different opportunities that could turn this into something new? Um, 
And then I guess my third contingency plan, which is probably more relevant for you guys as PhD students than it is for me at the moment, is the like, what if we really can't do field work for another year or two years? I mean, I hate to say that, but I, that's not totally outside the realm of possibility. And then I guess you need a real contingency plan, which is sort of suppose your, your job market paper or whatever the equivalent for uh, people in not in economics. Sorry, I don't know what the kind of capstone thing you're looking toward is, but suppose you really couldn't do field work for the next year at all. Um, what could you do? And some of that might be like Saad was saying, like take another look at existing data sources, um, think creatively about something really different. And that I guess thinking about that is probably going to suck a little bit, but I, I would have that in your back pocket just so that you know you can handle it and you don't have to freak out quite so much about the level of uncertainty we're dealing with right now about when restrictions would be lifted. Can I, can I jump in and, because I, I was listening to those two and, uh, and um, they gave me some couple more ideas um, about this particular question and thinking about uh, PhD students more specifically. But, so if you want to, to start doing work um, uh, to replace your standard survey with a phone survey, or if you want to, if you have not been able to do your listing uh, exercise or your, uh, um, you know, initial, you know, uh, uh, you, haven't, you haven't had the time to, uh, to come up with a partner, a local partner to do the field work. So I, I would say in those cases, um, one of the, as part of your strategy of, of, of realignment, you, you join forces. You, you find someone who already has a contact, who maybe already has an activity on the ground, who already has a, a team that can do phone surveys. And because you know pr the practicalities of doing the phone surveys are immediate. I mean, you know, how do you actually do a phone survey if you don't have the local infrastructure to, to do it? You, you need some people locally to be able to call, who can do that properly, can be relied on, can be paid, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so I, so I would say joint forces is a good idea. Um, in terms of others, I, I talked about observational observational data, but but maybe I should be more specific. Satellite data, social media data, remote sensing data, perhaps even health health center data, and so on. So these are all kinds of sources of data that are administrative type data or you know self generated by different organizations. They're observational, but nonetheless, they, they, they will still work. And in a sense, you can document what's going on through satellite data, for instance, if you, if, if you can get something that's measured. Uh, like, a, like if you look at pollution, for instance, we've, seen, we've all seen these maps of uh, pollution over time coming from satellite data. And the final point I was going to make is that, you know, this, it's, a, it's, it's a, a definitely a life experience, but it's also a life experience that is very unusual for us, um, in, as by which I mean, you know, people affiliated with Stanford as, as student or faculty, you know, we live in a fairly sheltered life. Uh, being locked up is not something we really consider normally. Um, uh, having uh, our mobility impeded is not something that we we, we face normally. So, um, I, I, in a sense, it's also an opportunity to, to learn about um, the situation of people who are in these kinds of circumstances, and it might actually be a source, in a say, in a sense, a source of inspiration for uh, for your own research interests. Might might actually change some of your research interests. I mean, you can do something on COVID nineteen. We can, you can also think more generally about people who are in prisons or people who are stuck at home because they can't, you know, go out. Their husband or their father-in-law doesn't want them to move. There are going to be all kinds of people who are constrained that way, or they are in refugee camp, so on and so forth. So they might they might be a research project that come out of your experience being locked down. Which Thanks, everyone. Um, and, uh, just a second. Uh, yep. Sorry, can I add one more thing? I realized we kind of I'm forgot about the second question that you um, that you had listed under the first thing. So just, I think somebody had been asking, like, how do you plan given this uncertainty about when we're going to be able to travel and things? And I, I'm not sure if this was how the question is meant, but I, I was taking that sort of like, literally, we don't know when we're going to be able to like fly to our field locations. And I guess my suggestion, just based on my own personal management is like, 
don't fixate on that. You can't fixate on that. It's just going to drive you nuts. Like nobody in the world right now has any sort of good estimate or any way of coming up with good estimates of when we're going to be able to do things. And so you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to do that. And so I guess my suggestion, or at least the way I'm managing myself on this is to kind of try to think about how much lead time will I need when I can get things going again and just backward induct from there. And I'm basically leaving myself reminders about, you know, two weeks before whenever that backward induction says I'd have to buy a plane ticket or start planning or send in the IRB application or whatever it is, I have a calendar reminder to myself saying now you're allowed to start thinking about it. And until then, <laughs> I'm not allowed to start thinking about it uh, just so that I don't spend all my time thinking about it. Wise words. Thanks, Meredith. Um, we had a question from Erica um, who's asking about how to conduct virtual or Skype interviews um, with communities that might not have access to internet or computers or mobile devices. And more broadly, what are your thoughts on things to think about when considering moving surveys from in-person interviews to phone or online? Um, okay, so the, so the first part of the question is how do you uh, you know, how do you do the impossible survey? So, you know, these people don't have a phone even. So, so I suppose one thing you, I, yeah, one thing that came to mind, you could send them a phone. If it's really essential to your research that you can speak to those people, send them a phone, uh, uh, hopefully, hoping that the phone reaches them. Cheap, phone, cheap phones these days are not, uh, you know, certainly affordable. Um, to, for for project, and you get a phone for ten dollars. I mean, I'm not talking about a smartphone, obviously. Then you can send them a phone, and then you can use that phone to talk to them. So that's what I would do about the first question. That's the only thing. If if it's essential that you have vis visual, then you're going to have to send them a tablet, or or, or 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 you know a second a second hand smartphone or something like that, or a cheap smartphone. Um, the other thing was um, how do you conduct. Uh, phone surveys and online surveys. Um, I haven't tried online surveys. I've, yeah, actually I, I have, yeah. For online surveys, it's a little bit easier. There's something called Qualtrics. I mean, everybody has heard of it. They probably have other outfits as well. Um, okay, so, okay, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, for small enough surveys, Qualtrics is free. So you can, and, and also if you are part of Stanford, um, you, you can use Stanford, uh, Stanford access co contract or agreement with Qualtrics to do surveys through them. They operate in multiple countries. So in principle, uh, you think, oh great, you know, 196 countries, that's fantastic. No, they don't, co Qualtrics doesn't cover 196 countries. They will say, oh, we, we they will say something like, oh, we have people in Kenya. And then you go to their, you say, oh, I would like to <clears throat> to do a survey of 200 people in Kenya. So, no, 200, we cannot do 200. <laughs> it's like maybe 15 or something. Like so, so, and I think the other outfits out there, um, at some point I was, uh, I was uh, in discussion with multiple different, different outfits. They have all different kinds of um, business uh, models. They, um, so different kinds of, you know, strategies, uh, some have very dedicated, um, very specific uh, uh, um, subject populations. I, there's one, I forgot the name now, but that has a, a subject population made of essentially managers in, in corporate, uh, you know, corporate firms. So managers and workers in corporate firms, which is very, very interesting. Uh, but they say they cover the world, but I think they have maximum 30 countries in there. So, and I think Costa Rica is in there, but probably not Nicaragua. You see what I mean? So the, the better off uh, of the of the developing countries might be there. Um, and so that's the problem. If you want to do online surveys, you can you have these uh, these outfits there. Um, they basically do two. They do three things for you. One is that they they um, they offer you a template that you can type your survey in. That in a sense, it's not that important. The second one is that they have a, a, a sample that you can draw from and they, they will, Qualtrics for instance, will offer, if you ask them, um, they will offer a stratified sample. So you say, I want this, my population to, to have this, you know, equal number of men and women and uh, some old people, some young people, some middle-aged people, and they will try to 
stratify the sample to match the population you're trying to mimic. Um, of course, you know, this is still going to be uh, drawn from a relatively small uh, subject pool. So it's more like, you think of it more like a, an experiment, a lab experiment or subject pool. So it's a selected pool. Um, the, and the third thing they will, they will do, which is kind of interesting for, for me, they will pay the subjects, okay? Pay the subjects. It turns out this is by far the hardest thing to do if you want to do it by yourself. Paying subjects is very, very, very complicated. Um, uh, you, can, you can pay subjects with Mechanical Turk, but then the, 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 that only operates uh, in the US and India, basically. I've done, yeah, that's, that's easy to use, actually, but it's only the US and India. Um, there, are, there are some other smaller operators there. Um, Prolific Academic, I think, is one of them. And then, um, but if you, move, if you want to move away from these uh, platforms, you want to go for Facebook, you will be able to recruit subjects uh, for surveys or, so, or online experiments through Facebook. Um, you have to learn how, basically, you'll be running Facebook ad campaigns to do that and you know they will charge you for that and it's going to be a, a lot a lot harder to get subjects in the US through that means and to get subjects in Kenya but the biggest problem at the end of the day was going to be how do you pay the subjects how do you pay the subjects um, even if you have to pay them four dollars each right um, and that, that has proved very very difficult to do um, so eventually what we've discovered is that we, we can do this through PayPal but again in a, in a very kind of restricted set of countries. In Africa, there's basically what we discovered. And PayPal's own website wasn't actually very informative. Like they, they would say, we, have, we are present in Mali, but then once we started recruiting subjects in Mali, what we discovered is that they could, they, you know, people in Mali could use PayPal to pay somebody in the US, but not the reverse. So we couldn't pay our subjects in Mali, you know, big deal. Yeah, very, very clever. So, so I think in, if you're in, in Africa, they only had um, South Africa, Kenya, Morocco, and Senegal, I think. So it's very limited. Nigeria is out. Very sad because it's an interesting country. Um, so that's what I was going to say about online. Um, I think I've lost, maybe I should, I should let the others talk as well. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not quite sure what the intent behind this question was. So I guess just two brief thoughts. So one is for those of you who are in fields that involve um, more, I guess, like sort of qualitative or in-depth interview type field work, I, I don't have any expert advice to offer you. My guess is that that's going to be really, really, really hard, right? That that the kind of strategies that we've been talking about, kind of work better the more um, quantitative and structured and targeted at populations that have access to remote communications technology they are right and the less your subject kind of corresponds to any of those the harder it's going to be to do um, uh, I, I guess i'm i the, the the one other thought going back to something sad said is you know I'm not quite sure what was meant about like whether this is an issue of the subjects literally not having phones or just that the initial plan involved sort of face-to-face -face interviewing. But this is a time when um, I think uh, there's a mismatch a little bit between where the like uh, resources are and where the people with projects are, if that makes sense. So I know at least for like uh, the economists and political scientists, like IPA and JPAL are trying really hard to keep their RAs and their enumerators working right now. And there are a lot of field projects that just can't go ahead. And so for instance, you know, if you're somebody with like uh, ideas or PI resources or money or something, but your problem is that you don't have field teams with equipment, to do this in place, it's possible that as I was saying, like sort of building a team 
where some people have the team on the ground and, and somebody else's money and somebody else has the idea about what's going on might be a good strategy. I, I don't think that's directly responding to the question about what if your respondents themselves really have no communication technology, but if that's true, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, what can be done. Thanks, uh, Saad, any thoughts on um, phone interviews or as well, since I know you're doing some? <laughs> Um, nothing beyond what's already been said, but, uh, yeah, I haven't actually done the phone surveys yet. So it's my understanding, is, at least in the context of Pakistan, people are often surprised. I think more than 95% of the people have phone numbers. Um, 70% of them pick up the phone when you call them. So getting access to people on the phone is a lot easier than what is commonly assumed. Um, people even answer IPR calls, about 25% of the, of, of the people not conditioning on who picks up the phone answer, answer phones. So, you know, phone surveys are um, more possible, at least in the context that I'm working in, than what I had assumed myself in the past, and definitely way more than what reviewers assume. Um, so, yeah, so don't discount that as an option, I would say. Thanks. Um, and looks like uh, Nick Lyon has a question. Uh, Leslie, can you unmute him? Hey. Uh, okay. Thanks, everyone, for your, your thoughts on this. Um, so I'm curious for those of you, and just sort of picking up on, on the conversation we've just been having about alternative modes of, of data collection, be it on, on phones or online surveys. I'm curious about your thoughts about what data collection during this time even means in terms of what that data is telling us, right? So I think, you know, just to take the United States as an example for all of these different outcomes that we care about, be it in, you know, any, any of our social science fields about development, you know, be it food consumption, labor force participation, you know, trade levels, you know, we think we might, we, we might think all of these will be affected by coronavirus in some sort of way, right? Current unemployment in the US just speaks to this, right? And I think we imagine this affects different countries in different sorts of ways. So for those of you who are continuing your data collection during this time and realizing that some of you have pivoted towards outcomes that seem more relevant to the current situation, if, if you have any projects for which you're currently collecting data still, in a way that you know, we want to speak to normal times, whatever that means, how are you thinking about data collection during this time and what measurement even means? And then perhaps an analog to this question is for those of you who have suspended end lines, you know, when might you be, like what are some of the signals you might be looking for in terms of resuming data collection and thinking about that data collection as, as representing something that at all approximates normal? I suppose it depends on the on the context on, on what it is exactly you're looking at, but the examples you've you've given indeed are problematic. Um, I suppose you could say if end line. So suppose that okay, you talk about end line. So let's say that you have you have not done you were supposed to do your end line now. You cannot do your end line, and you you realize that uh, the situation is very different now. I suppose you could do an end line on the phone, and then you you would see what's the effect of my treatment which hopefully was completed by the time uh, covid started you could you could look at how it differentially affects people um but i suppose um the the probably the more if you're really interested in um the effect of your treatment in normal times you you can wait i mean after all there's there's a you know there's a there's a big demand now in journals for long what they call long term effects so basically you know, anything beyond one year, basically, because the standard end line is a year after. So, you know, but so you say, well, I want to give enough time to the situation to stabilize. So let's give it, I don't know, two years, three years, four years. I'm going to have a, a short end line now on the phone. I'm going to have my big end line face to face three years from now, four years from now. Yeah, that's what I would do in a particular case. Um, there were other aspects of your question, but. Um, I forgot them now. 
I mean, some types of outcomes you want to measure, I think, will be easier than others. Um, in our context, what we're trying to measure through the phone survey is more sort of retrospective behavior instead of what they're doing right now. So we're interested in knowing, for example, if people, when was the last time people went to the, to the politicians, um, to their local politicians' home to petition them for, for, some, for some private good, for example. Now, that's an outcome that's easier to measure on the phone survey because we're thinking about what, would, what was happening before we had this kind of a shock. So if you're interested in retrospective data collection, I think maybe phone surveys are going to be very well suited for them. Um, you should read the appendix material of uh, Raul Sanchez de la Sierra's JPE article, where he, I think he described in detail his, uh, his panel, panel setup. Uh, through such, through that was an in, in-person interview, but the idea is very similar where you're trying to construct a yearly panel um, through retrospective, basically, data collection. So that might be a good way to think about phone surveys. I mean, of course, I think, as Marcel said, if you have a randomized treatment, you can think of, and you think that COVID is a common shock to your subject population, then the measurement error should be, you know, uh, distributed at random. So you can still use uh, the outcome that you have uh, you know, under certain assumptions. So yeah, think about those aspects of it. It is true that your behavior will be very different uh, under under the present circumstances when, uh, instead of under normal circumstances. So you know, I think the answer will really depend on the specific case that you have in mind. I guess I would also say, and I'm not I'm not sure if this was what was meant by the question, but there's kind of no magic here, and we shouldn't pretend that there is, right? I, I totally agree about collecting retrospective data, but if assuming that, you know, the idea is you have a project where you want to know something kind of by definition about what people are doing now or how things are, are now or what their expectations about the future are, I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no way to separate that out from, from coronavirus and you probably shouldn't try, right? I guess my, my suspicion is that you're, you're probably fooling yourself if you think that there's some way to totally separate that out or, or to be honest, even that there's going to be some time in the future when you can safely say, okay, now my results reflect like normal life. Like, you know, <laughs> even once restrictions are lifted, I think we should all think that um, there are going to be sort of long-term scarring of various sorts that's going to be heterogeneous across people and circumstances. And probably the best we can do is to try to kind of descriptively track how these outcomes are changing over time and, and how different people seem to be affected. And there's, I think it's unlikely that any time in the next five years, you're going to be able to say, okay, now is the time when it's safe for me to, you know, whatever it is, collect time use data or political opinions and argue that that's totally unrelated to coronavirus. Can, can I jump in for just one more comment about, a couple of comments about phone surveys. Um, the, the 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 first thing I was going to say is that if you if you if you're running phone surveys, most of the ones um, that I'm aware of are run by a, a calling pool in the country itself, which makes it makes it cheaper. So that means that if you haven't already set up that infrastructure, uh, you know, you need you're going to have to locate one. Uh, this happened to us recently. We were we had a bunch of enumerators uh, for face-to-face -face interviews in Cote d'Ivoire. But um, we didn't have a, a calling pool. So, but, but one of us did find a, an outfit, a local outfit who actually had expertise in that and, and were, we, you know, were at free, at free, um, free time to, 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 to work with us. So, so that's the first. I have, however, I'm aware of someone, uh, I think it was Nick Bloom, who ran a phone survey by calling everybody from London or something like that. Maybe not everybody, but they were calling Ghana. I remember that specific example. They were doing a phone survey of entrepreneurs, corporate entrepreneurs in Ghana, calling them from London. So I suppose if they can do it, you know, it's possible. Um, about the phone surveys, so, so it's true, um, it, it, it has some impediments because you can't really run a you know, two hour, four hour, even uh, certainly not four hour. Uh, interview a questionnaire over the phone. So you're gonna have to slice it into different uh, bits and pieces. Uh, it has some advantages as well. I mean, because 
if you if you're going to be you know parsing your 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 questionnaire into into multiple uh phone conversations over you know every week every two weeks every month i don't know then you at the same time and, and you know in week one you're going to cover module, module one of your questionnaire and week two module two and so on so then you can also have like 10 questions at the beginning which are always there so you're going to that, that will generate high frequency data which normally in a, in a typical uh, survey you would not have so think about you know that's an opportunity suddenly you force into a phone survey you're going to be calling people every week or every two weeks what is it that you that's part of your research question that would be interesting interesting to have uh, as a high frequency data and typically there are, there is some high frequency aspect that you might be interested in getting of course it's going to be during covid but um, um and there was one more thing i was going to say um right so if you're going to have so the final thing i was going to suggest is that so if you have a, a questionnaire let's say you have uh, module one and module two and so phone survey maximum maximum half an hour i would say um so let's say module one um, takes one one phone call and module two takes the other phone call you don't have to necessarily put all because remember covid is unfolding over time so and and it's a high moving thing so it changing changes very rapidly so probably you want to uh, like in, you would do in a lab experiment to have uh, half of your let's say you have only module one and module two to have half of your respondents answering module one in week one and the other half answering module two in week one and then you switch them around in week so that you have balance on the timing of the different modules that's what i was going to say thanks marcel and thanks everyone um another question um that we've gotten is that since we may, may well be grounded um, at Stanford after um, some field activities are, are cleared to resume, um, what advice do you have for working with partners remotely? And are there specific tools you use for collaboration and keeping on top of uh, developments with your field teams? Um, so this is sort of broader advice, I guess, than um, just for uh, this COVID scenario. Thanks. Uh trust trust based on re repeated interaction i see meredith is smiling because of course that's what she works on and i've worked on that as well so yeah where does trust come from from familiarity familiarity comes from what from from interaction can you monitor everybody remotely no are they going are they going are you going to have a problem with uh, enumerators faking the data yeah, some some there's always that problem. But even in face-to-face -face interviews, and somebody who's stopped in a little bar somewhere and just filling the, the questionnaire. So there are the typical techniques that you use that can be used uh, to um, to control for that, basically. But basically, but the the main the main issue is going to be trust. How do you identify a, a, a an outfit out there that you can trust? And that's where again my my earlier advice: join forces. With a with a faculty member, with with another, an exist a pre existing team, people who already have established uh, relationships, um, uh, it, it's probably going to be the best way. If I had to do it, that's that's how I would do it. I, the, the the final thing I was going to say about that is, don't forget that you're stressed, right? You're stressed. Your your research plans have been messed up. You you know you're you're, you're anxious. You would like to finish your thesis. You know, you have a certain time time horizon you're not the only person who's stressed people on the other side are stressed as well they probably stress not so much for time but you know for money they got financially they're going to be suffering they, they are the people who will execute the, the surveys and all that they probably have, have been a massive cut in their normal income flow and so um so i guess what i'm trying to say is that um you know Try to, to you want you want to establish a a uh, a good relationship with the. It's always true, of course, that you want to establish a good relationship with the team you're working with. But it would be to establish a relationship. It, it will help if you if you put yourself in their shoes as well. So what 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 are their main concerns right now? Um, how can I um, help them? Um, 
you know, help me. The only other thing I'll add is um, um, maybe now is a good time to just informally chat with people you know in the areas that you're working in, you know. And sometimes those conversations, when you're not doing them under pressure of a specific project, can also yield some interesting ideas. Um, and in any case, those are the people that you should be relying on for uh, to determine when it, when is it feasible to resume work, even if you as a Stanford affiliate cannot travel. When is it ethical to resume work given local circumstances? Um, so yeah, to it's all. It, I think it always is nice if you if you have local people that you are in regular touch with. If you are from that area yourself, you know have have conversations with people who are based there, even if you are not and uh, take lead from them. Yeah, so three brief thoughts. So on sort of partners or field management, um, I totally agree with what Marcel was saying that, you know, remember they're probably stressed out about some of the same things you are, plus a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so I guess, Two ideas. So one one thought, as Saad was saying, is just to make sure that you're aware of what's going on locally and that you can at least be sympathetic and aware of that. So I've been having a lot of conversations with my management team in Lagos about, I guess, you know, on top of everything else, like there are basically like gangs roaming around neighborhoods at night, breaking into people's houses and stealing stuff. And like just chatting with them, I discovered that they were like staying up all night to contribute to basically the block watch in their neighborhoods which is just like crazy and like in addition to sympathizing, like it's good for me to know that they've been up all night, <laughs> right? Um, and I guess the second thought, and maybe more with sort of external partners than your internal team, is right now there might be things that you can do for them that don't directly to contribute to your research, but would actually be really helpful to them and are good for relationship building, right? So like if you have partners in government or NGOs, like something that might just be trivial to you, like putting together a two-pager with some descriptive data analysis or like pulling some official statistics off of some website or international organization and putting it together for them. Like they might actually really appreciate something like that because they have to report to funders or they have to make decisions really quickly and like data analysis is easy for you and hard for them. And maybe just kind of checking in and seeing if there's something about their operational mission that you could do a little bit of work to contribute to. Um, might be both helpful to the world and go some way toward relationship building. Um, just briefly, the last thing on kind of your own team, if you are doing data collection, is um, I guess I would go overboard on processes and take your time to make sure that they're actually being complied with um, and that you notice if there's something off with either kind of the procedures being followed or the data quality. And I guess that's always probably the way to do data collection, but especially now, if you can't be there, there are just things that you would kind of notice casually in person that you're no longer gonna be able to notice casually. And so you have to have a system in place for detecting them instead. So, um, you know, my team has sort of like crazy level of procedures about like things that they send a WhatsApp photo to them, like, RA about when they clock in in the morning and then they fill out like a Google sheet at the end of the day that has like redundancies with the data they've submitted on survey CTO. And then we run our high frequency checks every day and we check like for the match between the Google sheet thing that they submitted and the survey CTO data they've submitted and we have conversations with them about it all the time. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about the, the concrete details of that later if they want to, but I guess just like go, go overboard on procedures and back checks. Thanks very much, all. And uh, one final question. Um, do you have any thoughts on uh, what students or others might want to consider um, when incorporating a COVID-19 related component into ongoing projects? Yes, as I was explaining, uh, we, we've, we've tried to do that in, um, in two countries, in Cote d'Ivoire and in Ethiopia. We've been, we've been, the project we had in India just had to completely stop. Um, so, but then the, these are, these become COVID specific um, projects. Now, I mean, I don't know if you've looked at the different calls for proposals. I mean, the, 
there have been lots of them. Um, they usually are for relatively small amounts of money. The ones I've seen, uh, the maximum I've seen was 75K. Uh, there was one that was saying 20, 20K, another one that was saying 25K. It was relatively small um, amount. Um, so, you know, clearly you can't uh, launch a really large project on that. Usually the calls I've seen that a lot of them were very specific. So, so for instance, there was a, a, a JPAL call and it, it sounded very interesting initially until we realized that basically what they wanted to do is, is for people who had already an RCT in the field, uh, somebody was mentioning, I think was, was mentioning it earlier, somebody who had already an RCT in the field, they wanted to test um, whether this RCT would affect you know, people differentially uh, as a function of COVID. So, so, um, so it was very specific. It, it, you, you, you couldn't do, uh, so that was one call. It was another one who was a bit more general. They said, oh, well, we would like to follow what's happening to people, how they are affected by COVID. That sound, okay, that's sound more, more like observational. Uh, but then they said, oh, by the way, we really would like you to use our questionnaire. And here's the, you know, <laughs> there's so many pages of the questionnaire. So, you know, it's like, oh, you don't really have the same freedom. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very, and, and then of course, every other day there's a, there's another call. So, so it's a very rapidly changing um, situation. The one thing that uh, um, can become a constraint, hasn't become a constraint for us yet because it hasn't, hasn't arisen yet, but one thing that may become a constraint is IRB. I mean, if you do get the money and uh, you are trying, you get, you got in, You've got a 25k to do a small COVID-19 survey in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, you want to feel right away. So let's say that you have the team, you have the questionnaire, you're ready to go, but then you need the IRB. What are you going to do? So I, I think it's for the has advertised the fact that they're going to have accelerated IRB procedures, emergency procedures. Um, I haven't tested their their you know their response time yet. Maybe maybe. Uh, Silent and Meredith. And I, I have, and the initial response was very fast, but it was still like a month before we got final approval. Yeah, I'm three weeks into an IRB protocol right now, so it's not very fast, actually. Um, so this is, it's uh, three o'clock now, so I just wanted to, to wrap up and um, Marcel, Meredith and Saad, uh, greatly appreciate you joining us today. Um, and thanks very much to, to everyone else for, for joining as well. Uh, particularly since this is a new format for us, um, we look forward to your feedback and suggestions um, if there are other topics that would be useful to, to hear from faculty on um, please in virtual discussions, please do let us know. And again, thanks to everyone um, for joining. And if there's any questions, um, Karina and I will stay on um, for a little bit longer to talk about mechanics of King Center research funding, um, if anyone would like to. Thanks again.